the Christian calendar, we're in the midst of a holiday called Lent, <clears throat> or a holiday period because it extends for 40 days. In the Eastern churches, it's called the Great Lent <clears throat> because it is preparation for the great event of life, which is the completion of the ego's crucifixion and the resurrection into new life. And so as we prepare for Semana Santa, Holy Week, we also as Sat Yogis must be in a state of spiritual preparation for our resurrection, our rebirth into the final state, the ultimate unfoldment of our being that is represented in Christianity by the risen Christ. <clears throat> Every calendar, which is a religious object, by the way, is a way of noting the various changes and phases in the growth and spiritual development of individuals, societies, civilizations, and ultimately the world itself. And each year is a microcosm of the great year, the great yuga, the kalpa, in which all of the seasons, the eras, the eons of life are fulfilled in all of their glory. And satyogis recognize that every religion is a part of a single whole. Every religion points to the same ultimate truth, but each one has a part of the puzzle, and yet all are congruent. And in the process of history, each religion is built upon the strata of previous religious and symbolic systems. And as time and cultures became more integrated, then there was a hybridization, an integration of the various symbol systems of different groups that had come together, that had some collision, perhaps a clash, but also in some way a nourishment and a filling out of missing pieces and in some cases, a repression of some pieces that had been apparent that became unacceptable to certain later symbol systems that could not handle too much information. And so a great deal of the situation we are involved in today is based on the fact that we have suffered from cultural and historical amnesia. Much of the meaning of the prior historical religious symbol systems have been lost. And even Christianity in its current form and Judaism and Islam as well are abiding in the most superficial level of their symbolic meanings and the depths of those meanings and the application of those to oneself at the deepest core of one's being as a mandate for growth and transformation and a procedure, a map, an understanding both of the nature of time and the nature of the necessity of being adequate to the demands of that moment in time have been lost. And because of the changes in the configuration of time itself, we have become out of sync 
with the needs and the relationship between time and timelessness. So for example, the word Lent comes from the fact that the days have been lengthening since Christmas. And the lengthening, the word length comes from Lent, means the days go slower, they go more lento, as they say in Spanish. And so that slowness and length of time seems to be expanded. But nowadays, time has speeded up and everything is happening more rapidly. And so we have a very paradoxical relationship to Lent today as has never existed in prior historical epochs. But the period, this 40-day period, and of course 40 is an extremely important number being the amount of days of the fast of Jesus in the desert and Moses on Mount Sinai, etc. And it seems to represent the limit of what human capacity is for its ascetic withdrawal from nourishment. I can testify that after my own 40-day fast. And it is a necessity for each of us to take it to the limit to go as far as we can, as deep as we can, and let go of as much as we can of the ego, of its gratifications, its desires, its fears, its props and addictions, and learn to go it alone into that inner solitude of emptiness, of the desert where we must die to the ego and be reborn as pure spirit. The Christian <clears throat> tradition was nourished itself by many previous symbol systems and procedures. One, of course, was the Jewish and Easter, as, which is what we are approaching, is also based upon the Pesach or Passover holiday. And of course, the Jews, in order to be saved from the angel of death, would sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on their door sills. And uh, the blood of the lamb was the sacrifice. But it was an animal sacrifice, meant to be a metaphor for the sacrifice of the ego. And because it was too distant, there needed to be a new covenant in which the sacrifice was that of a human, not a human other, but Christ as representing the self. It is our own ego that must be crucified, the blood of our own inner being, which has not been lamb-like, but lion-like, not in the sense of true empowerment, but that carnivorous being that is vampiric on the blood of others and has not been a being who is a manifestation of the peace and the light and the love of God must die. And so Jesus comes as that lamb willing to sacrifice himself for the sins of all. And each of us must do that, to sacrifice the ego for the sake of the resurrection of our entire world. The first crucifixion, if we want to go back in time, because there have been many, every symbol system prior to the, the Jewish system, the Hebrew, the Israelite system was based on crucifixion. The cross is a very ancient symbol. It's there in ancient Egypt. It's there throughout the Middle East. It goes to India. It's everywhere. It goes back to the swastika, in fact. And you will find equivalent archetypal figures who have gone through almost the exact same kind of life as Jesus, whether it's 
Horus and in the Isis and Osiris story, or it's Adonis or Bacchus or any of the spiritual heroes prior to Christianity. And it's also because the Jewish and Christian traditions arose out of an earlier goddess tradition. It was Asherah, and before her it was Astarot, and before other goddesses back to Ishtar. And Ishtar is the most filled out and elaborated mythology about the rise and the fall of the goddess, the divine feminine, who is the carrier of the sacred heart that became the heart of Jesus. And the story of Ishtar is that she goes from the highest state of the golden world, the palaces of the, the world of the gods and goddesses and falls to the point where she ends up as the whore of Babylon and then completely naked and defiled in her lowest state and then she is risen again. I won't go into that whole myth now, but it is that rising of the goddess that is celebrated on Easter, which comes from the word Ishtar. And Christ is a new manifestation of Ishtar before he is anything else. He is she, the goddess. And why on Easter do Christians still celebrate by buying new clothes? It is Ishtar who is again dressed in the golden robes of the goddess, whose new clothes represent also the new manifestation of divine life that also ushers in the new world, brought about by the love and the light of the goddess and the unification of the goddess with the great Father God, and the father and mother in unity then produce the children of the new world, the new golden age. Which is why one of the meanings of Christ comes from the word gold in the ancient world, in, in Greek and other languages, chrysa, and we get it in the word chrysalis, chrysanthemum, the golden flower. We have it in many places. And why? Because Christianity also developed out of the Greek mystery schools. And it was the latest incarnation of that mystery school tradition in which the initiate would go for three days into a dark cave that was called the cocoon or the chrysalis and they would stay long enough to find their inner light. And after three days, they would come out filled with that golden light of pure spirit. Just as Christ had to die and for three days go down into the underworld and destroy the demons, the harrowing of hell, and then come for the ascension. And each of us has to go into that black hole of our shadow and kill all of our demons and the ego itself in order to emerge as the ascended, luminous, reborn being. On Easter, there is also the symbol of the egg. And the egg, of course, is the cosmic egg, and it is the, the egg of the the, the pure spirit, it represents the shape of the flame. It goes back to the Shiva Lingam, but it, and, it, and the egg is Anda. And it means that, and at a deeper level, that there are two births. First is the laying of the egg, but then the bird must peck through the shell, crack through, and be born again. You see, and so the egg represents the Dvija, we have here the Dvija Karmashala, the twice born workhouse that was moved from the ancient original place and rebuilt. Well, we must go through that same Dvija, the deconstruction of the ego, the breaking through into the emptiness, and then the rebirth, the victory, Jaya or Ja or Ya, and the word Yahshua 
is that. The ya comes from that victory, jaya, originally in Sanskrit, and the shua was originally shunya, the birth into the great emptiness, the void, which is filled with the golden light. And so we must go through the birth through the larval stage of the ego and be reborn as pure spirit, but using all of our might, our power, our faith, our truthfulness, our clarity, our goodness to break through the shell of the ego at all costs and then take it to the limit and spread our wings and fly into that celestial realm of pure consciousness that brings us into unity with God. The first crucifixion happened long before the time of Jesus. As I say, Bacchus and others were all crucified. But if you go back to the first one, you have to go back to the very ancient Puranas in India. And what happened occurred in the court of Indra, and the man who built that court and all of the palaces and the temples, and in fact, almost the whole world, was the architect and handyman of the gods whose name was Vishvakarman, more or less what Ashoka is in our Sangha. And Vishvakarman, had a daughter named Sanjana. And this word could mean soul consciousness. And Sanjana was given in marriage by Vishvakarman to none other than Surya, the sun. But the problem was Sanjana couldn't handle Surya's light. He was simply too bright for her. And she complained to daddy, please do something. I love the guy, but I can't handle his energy. And so Vishvakarma said, okay. And he called Surya into his workshop. And he said, why don't you lie down here? And he nailed him to this cross that he had. And he took off an eighth of his sun rays at the top, sort of like a haircut. <laughs> and then there were like dark rays that looked like a crown of thorns coming out of the sun's head. And Vishvakarman called Sanjana over and said, is that enough? Can you handle him now? And she said, yeah, I think so. And so he let him off of the crucifixion and now uh, he could uh, be married to the soul who could deal with her. But then secretly he began to grow his rays back and she had to become as bright and filled with spirit as he was. And so the same story of Christ we see is a repetition of much more ancient mythologies. And this mythology of having the haircut, of course, is part of the tradition of sannyasis who enter into true discipleship. And it is that uh, entering in in which they shave their heads. They remove the effulgence, you could say, that is uh, the nature of the hair to represent that beauty, that light, that power. And that must all be removed in order for the initiate to achieve the humility necessary for the work of inner processing and letting go of body consciousness in order to attain pure spirit. And this becomes the word vikartan in Sanskrit, this shaving of the initiate, which became in Christianity the word vicar who represents God, but at a lower level of brightness. And so it is a representation of the God figure, but does not have that power. The vicar, of course, and the word then became also used as vicarious, leading a life that is actually uh, an imitation or proxy of that which is much more bright and authentic. 
And so we have become ever more vicars of Christ rather than living in Christ consciousness until we have even lost our vicarage, our vikram, our capacity to move into that transformed state. And we have fallen into that state in which we have lost all of our brightness. And the darkness, the shadow, has created a world of suffering. And so here at the end of the calendar, the Kal Andar, which means end of time, and the Anda means both the end and it means the inner. Anta, Anta means end, but Ananta means endless. At this time of the end, we must rediscover our endlessness, which in the Kabbalah is the Ein Sof, the God consciousness that transcends the ego, that can only be refound at the death of the ego. It is this moment that we are preparing for in reality because we all can see that time in this historical phase is in fact at an end, civilization is in collapse. The moment of Armageddon is very close and the darkness has taken over the world. The light is gone and this is the time of Lent indeed when we must do penance for our own having fallen into the darkness and must go through our own crucifixion so that we again become beings of light who can bring a new light of pure spirit to the fallen world and raise it again to become a kingdom of heaven. All of these mythological systems point to the same reality. And we could have found congruent mythological themes in Islam and Taoism and in all of the great religions of the world and the great esoteric systems. It is indeed a perennial philosophy. But at the end of time, we can no longer settle for philosophy. We can no longer settle for knowing this intellectually. We must go through the great death, Mahakal the death of death, the death of the mortal mind, the mind that identifies with the body that is mortal, and find that immortal, eternal, infinite flame within that alone has the power to redream this fallen and dying world and give it new life. And it is the fulfillment of that divine responsibility that we prepare for at an ashram, especially at an ashram like this, at the end of time, at the end of the world, in which there is nothing left to do, to hope for from out there, but only to discover that supreme power with which we may be able to recede the world. We must recede from the world to have the seeds to bring to the world. And the great myth and symbolic meaning of the seed, especially the sesame seed, which comes, the word sesame comes from shamash, from again, the great light, the surya, the sun. It must be crushed if you want the oil and it is that oil that lights the lamp. It's that oil that is the anointment that means the Christo, the anointment that comes from crushing the ego, killing it, releasing the bound energies to become again available as pure spiritual power that uplifts, enlightens, redeems, and saves oneself one's community, one's world. But only when the crushing of the ego is complete so that the power of God flows without 
any interference. It is that completion of the great work which we are called upon to do here and now in the great Lent at the end of time which will bring about the ascension of this crucified world and its lost souls to again refine the realm of the luminous presence of God and give rebirth, a new springtime to this wounded nature so that the goddess of nature, Gaia, can once again bring a replenishment of the beauty, the richness of life, back to a world that had been defiled and raped by human malfeasance, again to a world in which we are careful guardians and stewards and have earned the right to live as gods and goddesses through our own divinization, our own theosis, which is the ultimate achievement called upon in all religions to be achieved at the end through our absolute surrender to God in which no ego, no difference, no separation, no particle of otherness from God remains. All has been crushed, all has been turned to the pure oil of divine life and love and the world flows with that oil which is also the nectar of immortality so that all may be anointed, all may drink, all may be filled, all may be nourished by this power of divine love that once again let loose from the dungeons of the closed hearts of the egos will redeem the world with that ultimate power of goodness and unity. May we achieve in the real in this plane that fulfillment of the mandate that is given to us by every religion and achieve it now at the time in which we are called upon to gain the ultimate victory over Maya. And to live in truth. And to heal with truth. Namaste.